Yeah, okay, we are on now. This is our, our boat card. Uh, it's handy to have those available to exchange with other boaters. This is Valeta 4, an Ontario 32. Uh, we've been living on it uh, since 1998. Um, and we have sailed over 65,000 nautical miles. Uh, this is its, its present configuration. We have a hard bimini. We no longer have the uh, wind generator. Uh, we have mast steps going up the mast, radar, all that kind of good stuff. So that uh, we are quite happy with the boat. Uh, as I, as uh, Diane mentioned, it's in Northern Mexico right now on the hard, uh, awaiting the borders to open so we can have it shipped up to Chicago. And from there, we will sail it up here to the North Channel Yacht Club, uh, just about a half hour's drive from our home here in Elliott Lake. Now, for the previous uh, presentation, uh, Chris Hope was talking about the fact that he was a member of the uh, British Keel Yacht Club. Well, I just so happened to also be a member of that. And I got my skipper's certificate uh, back there well, sometime in, uh, I think, 1978. Now, what we are proposing to do today is take a look at our trip from Esquimalt. Uh, we initially planned going from Esquimalt over to Port Angeles and then around and down the West Coast. At the end of August, we were all set to go. And the day before, we were taking my niece out for a little uh, ride up into Esquimalt Harbor on that. However, in spite of the fact that we had been on the West Coast for over five years, and we had gone through Bergy bits and uh, lumber yards and the areas of that, we had not caught anything in our prop. However, on this occasion, when I was trying to back out of our slip, we caught a log rob in our prop and it damaged it quite badly so that uh, we had a very bad vibration. So we had to get that repaired before we could leave. So rather than going straight across to Port Angeles, we arranged to go all the way up to Sydney where there was a Vector yacht and they were going to be able to take care of it. However, we also had to make that trip, it was about a 35 mile run. We had to make that trip without an engine. And we did it by having launching the Leda from the Esquimo in the appropriate uh, current pattern, the tides. And so we caught a tide coming out and going up the coastline here. And we could put the engine on, but uh, whenever we uh, ran the prop, there was a very bad vibration. So we couldn't use the engine very much. Uh, so we did a side tow. And that is the way in which we wound up getting up to Sydney. Now, the other thing that uh, when we left there, we then came down to Cadbury Bay and then down to Port Angeles and across. But right now, let's talk about getting up to Sydney. Here I am with a side tow in our dinghy. Uh, we have the uh, uh, Jenny up. I'm not sure that we had the name up then or not. Do you remember, Dee? I don't remember. I, I suspect we didn't just because, because I can see you. But yeah, so that uh, we have the dinky at the side. So we had a 15 horsepower Johnson, so it, it helped quite a bit. And then the wind also helped. You can also see that we have an extension tiller on our outboard, which uh, is very handy. Uh, so we could set the uh, self steering system and go for quite a while. So that Judy was able to take some pictures. In fact, we even trained, changed around and had Judy uh, in the dinky uh, helping with the side door. And uh, here she is also. <laughs> With her ebook reader because she didn't have anything else to do while we were doing that. So, this is the way we went up. We didn't know where Vector Yachts was. And so, this is the large harbor of Sydney. We'd never been in there before, but we ventured our way up this channel and over this way. And we actually passed Vector Yachts. We didn't see any sign. And we had to do a, a turnaround in a very narrow uh, confine to get back into the Vector Yacht. So here's the later hauled out. The, well, the prop was damaged and the strut holding the uh, shaft was also damaged. So this is the, what the later had on her bottom. 
after being in the salt water for several years. So the uh, shaft was removed, the strut was removed, and started cleaning up the uh, hull of Valeta. We were there for about uh, 10 days or so. Um, so we had a chance to do some other odd facades on the boat. So here we are with the, uh, the shaft inserted, uh, the new strut, uh, the propeller repaired and retorqued. And uh, it was uh, quite nice. While we were there, we have it, we touched up some of the bottom paint and did a nice uh, water stripe painting. So we went down from Sydney. We stopped in Cadbury Bay overnight at the anchor there. And then we went down the next day to Port Angeles and did all our, our uh, in, inland procedures, uh, got our cruising permit and all that kind of good stuff. The it was economical there. It was only seven, like 70 cents a foot. Then we went from Port Angeles, about 56 miles up here to Mia Bay. We anchored there for a couple of nights. And then we started on a long run around Cape Flattery, heading down to um, Oregon, actually. But when we were crossing the Strait of Juan de Fuca, there was there quite frequently fog bank. So here is a, a, a large boat carrier uh, coming through the fog banks. And you see it as it's emerging. But this is what it was like driving across the uh, sea of the Strait of Juan de Fuca. We, we across it at right angles so that we were out of the uh, traffic zones as fast as possible. Well, there's that one boat. <laughs> including a little uh, seagull that uh, managed to get into the picture. And then here was another vessel that we passed at the same time. This is a large uh, container ship. Now, something else that you notice, the current there. You can see the current in the central part and then the calm areas here. So there was a fair amount of current in the Strait of Juan de Fuca. So we went from Nia Bay down from around Cape Flattery and we did a long run uh, down to Newport, uh, Oregon. Uh, this was a, that was a 235 mile run. There are very few places that we could go into in Washington state other than the Columbia River. And the Columbia River has a very dangerous bar in that area and even offshore because of the various currents. So we gave it a wide berth and didn't even bother. So we did a straight run of 235 nautical miles to get down to Newport. Uh, in our calculations, we calculated averaging 100 nautical miles a day. And if we did that, that was fine. If we did more than that, that was good. If we did less than that, it was a bit of a drifter. And we also had to watch to make sure that we would be able to get into our next port in daylight hours. So we always had those considerations to make. So here we are coming into uh, the port of Newport, Oregon. And this was the entrance channel. Now there's a lot of heavy wave action because you've got the entire Pacific rolling across onto the West Coast. And so there are some very treacherous wave patterns and surges. Uh, Marina? Yeah, this, uh, this is characteristic of a lot of the entrances there. There, are, there aren't a lot of natural harbors. There are long break walls built out from whatever the entrance is in an attempt to limit the silting and provide some shelter as a vessel's coming in. But a lot of them also, in fact, most of them, had there was the potential that the harbor could be closed because the conditions were deemed too dangerous. Yeah, we so we have to play that, pay, pay attention to that as well. This is what the coastline looked like along there. And there were several large outlying islands. So we had to give uh, the coastline a fairly wide berth because of these uh, islands that were protruding out uh, from the coast. Now alongside here, we have this, uh, I'm not sure if that's an elephant seal or not, but uh, they managed to uh, make themselves at home on some of the docks in the area. While we were there, we went to a, an enjoyable aquatic uh, museum. Aquarium. And uh, I took this picture of the uh, Starfish as jellyfish. they were wafting through the Jealous. jellyfish as they were wafting through the area. It was a beautiful, uh, attractive uh, 
pattern that uh, we saw with all these jellyfish. And there were several other areas in there, including some very interesting ones with the uh, octopus. Now, the, we rented a car for a few days, and Oregon is noted for bridges, the wooden bridges. Is there a question? Um, we'll wait for questions until the end. It's easier to do that. Yeah. Yeah. Questions at the end. Yeah, there are a lot of covered bridges, and we went and toured them. Yeah, we, the bridges were built sometime in the early 1900s, uh, especially during World War I, when metal wasn't available. And so they made these wooden bridges. And a wooden bridge without a cover on it would only last for eight to 10 years. But a, a covered wooden bridge would last for 80 or 90 years without having any major reconstruction. And so there were many of these uh, in the area, and we had a good time going through them. Like these. And it was interesting wandering in through the. Uh, the they had a, a, an interesting smell to them, and some of them had some echoes that were quite enjoyable. There's actually an organization that uh, takes care of the uh, covered bridges in Oregon, and there are probably over a dozen of them. Now, from there, we went down to a place called Coos Bay. And as you can see, it is a very large bay. There's a major uh, pier up here for uh, lumbering, mining, and uh, containers. Uh, this goes down into a very interesting estuary where there is a uh, provincial or state park. We, we went alongside in the marina here, but we also dinghied all the way down in here because we could have, if we wanted to, we could have anchored in some of these lower bays. But uh, the main, th main activity on the docks here was crab fishing. And people were out there all times and season. In fact, when we went alongside, we had to ask a couple of people to shift their nets because they were uh, occupying uh, one of the piers that we wanted to come alongside. So here's a gentleman here doing crabbing with his faithful dog and he's doing something on his uh, cell phone. These lines here are his crab pots down the bottom. And they leave the crab pots on the bottom. I think they use something like chicken necks or chicken legs to as a kind of uh, appetizer for Bait. the crabs. And after leaving them down there in about a half hour, they can pull them up and they'll have maybe a dozen or two dozen crabs in their uh, trap. However, they have to separate the crabs and throw the smaller ones back. And that's why there's so much debris on the uh, dock here when they had to swim through their trap trap crab traps and get rid, rid of the uh, seaweed and all that was accumulating. Now this was a, a memorial they had there. It's quite sobering when you see the number of fishermen who have been uh, killed at sea uh, over the years. From this small town. Yeah. And when we were leaving here, as Judy mentioned, they sometimes would close the harbor. And this harbor was closed for a couple of days. And as soon as we saw the, the lights on the harbor indicating it was safe to go out, we took off. We couldn't check our timing. We had to go as soon as it was available. And as we were going out the harbor, this large uh, lumber ship was also coming out at the same time. So we had to stay over to one side of the uh, area to let him go by. And then when he did, we had a very heavy uh, sea uh, that, yeah, that he created. But even outside, this is the kind of heavy weather we saw as soon as we got outside of that uh, particular harbor. Things had quieted enough that they opened the harbor, but that didn't mean it was quiet out there. So we went from Coos Bay. We were initially planning to go uh, right down to Crescent City or possibly all the way down to Port Bragg. But once we got out there, it was still heavy weather. And we had predominant winds from the west and, of course, the swell. And so we were wallowing back and forth very painfully. So rather than making the full trip down, we went into Port Orford. However, we had to do, a, we were doing a nighttime entry into this particular port. There was no marina as such there. Their fishing boats that they had were all dry, dock, dry land uh, boats. So we had to navigate very carefully in there at nighttime, uh, 
looking, going over towards an area that we thought was acceptable, but we didn't know exactly how far the uh, shoal came out. So we gave it a wide berth and we anchored in about 40 feet of water, I guess. <coughs> and so we stayed there for the night. The interesting thing when you're doing a night entry is to see in the morning where you actually are, how far you are off the shore. We could go into it at night because it was an anchorage rather than a, a harbor that we had to enter. Um, it wasn't a terribly well sheltered anchorage, but it was an anchorage. Yeah. There, as I said, there weren't a lot of them along that coastline. However, the next place that we went, Crescent City, was another anchorage. And we were able to, again, to go in an anchor rather than having to the poor marina. Yeah, it was another 80 mile run down here to Crescent City. So we just stayed uh, anchored off. And then we went on down uh, for a long run, 130 miles uh, down to, pardon me, 150 miles down to Fort Bragg. Uh, Fort Bragg is a large military base. Uh, in fact, right now it is not politically correct and the American military are thinking of changing it, the name of it, because Fort, because General Bragg was a Confederate officer and the American military is determined to get rid of any of the forts that are named after Confederate officers. The Noyo River was at, at, Fort, at Fort Bragg. Bragg. And so we took our dinghy and dinghied up the quiet river, beautiful pastoral kind of situation, including these lovely uh, feathered uh, marsh reefs. And they had some very interesting small uh, boats. I love the jaunty look of this small fishing boat. And in behind they had a uh, resort, an RV spot, but it was not really a, a fancy resort. It was pretty down to earth. In fact, when we dinghied up the river to get a, uh, some fuel tanks uh, filled up. Uh, we went in <laughs> and the place had banners all over for the National Rifle Association and President Trump. This was in uh, 2016. It was, they, he wasn't president yet, but they were definitely in favor of his election. Okay, so we went then from Fort Bragg all the way down another uh, 130 miles to San Francisco. Uh, again, the complication is trying to make sure we get in there in daylight hours. And when we got there, this was in the morning, about 10 o'clock, and there's still a fog uh, outside uh, the uh, Golden Gate Bridge. So here we are going underneath the uh, Golden Gate Bridge into the main bays of San Francisco. Now we spent about two weeks in San Francisco. Uh, when we went in, we went through the uh, Golden Gate Bridge and across the bay over to Berkeley. And we stayed at the Berkeley Yacht Club uh, for uh, several days while we were there. And we traveled all around these areas of the San Francisco Bay. San Francisco has five major bays, the South Bay, the San Francisco Bay itself, the Central Bay, San Pablo Bay, and Susan Bay. And so we were fortunate, we were able to travel all of these areas of San Francisco. Alcatraz Island is uh, in the middle of Central Bay. And then there's another large island called Angel Island. And then there are several small islands off the coast of uh, the various bays there. So here we are traveling north of Alcatraz Island. It's no longer a penal, a penal colony or a, a, a penitentiary. Uh, it has been vacated dole for at least 15 or 20 years and longer. Uh, after it was vacated, the American Indian Movement uh, did a, uh, an occupation of it for several weeks in that as well. It's now a museum. Yeah, and in normal times, uh, many tourists go out to see it. And this was the Berkeley Yacht Club where we stayed. They're very friendly people. We find that having, uh, that when we went into any yacht club, uh, and presented our own yacht club background, uh, we were welcome with no problems at all, even though they were not formal reciprocal well, arrangements. The further you are from home, the less likely it is that you actually need to have a reciprocal arrangement. The less likely it is there will be one, but you also don't need it because it's not as if they're worried that if they let you in, 150 boats from your club will show up next week. You're it. <laughs> 
so we stayed alongside right up right outside of their uh, their main clubhouse and uh alongside the dock here we had uh, water and power available to us there's a large entrance in here several other yacht clubs uh there so we're right in the heart of uh, southern california and california wealth so that uh, there are many of these vessels here and while we were there uh, we had I had Judy climb up the mast because a couple of nights earlier on our way down, I noticed that our main our main sail was kind of slack. And when I pulled in the halyard to try to tighten it up, it still was slack. When I tried to lower the uh, topping lift, the boom came down quite a bit. And then we realized that the main halyard had fractured at the uh, head of the mast. So that we made the last few days traveling with no mainsail. We pulled the mainsail down and we uh, did the last couple of days travel with just the Genoa and our uh, engine. And of course that mainsail uh, having its lost its halyard had to happen at nighttime. I mean it couldn't happen during the daytime when you could see what was happening. So anyway we had Judy up the mast and in order to get the halyard down the mast Judy had a, a small line with a weight on it, and she then dropped it down the mast, and I had to try to feel through at the bottom to see if I could pull it out. So after a bit of fiddling, we finally got uh, the halyard uh, reestablished. Mind you, also while I was up the mast, it was I can't remember what the other job was I had to do, but realized while I was up there that not only did I not have with me whatever the part was I needed, but we didn't have it on board. Fortunately, there was a chandlery just across the bay. So I sat up there on my bosun's chair and having yelled down to operate the directions of exactly what we needed, well, he went shopping and <laughs> then came back to retrieve me. Yeah, so I, I left Judy up a mast there for about 15 or 20 minutes while I went across the bay to, to get the part that she needed. Incidentally, you can see at the top of the mast, we have a large radar reflector, a metal radar reflector that we've uh, put up there as a fixture. And we've been told that we paint like a ship, which is fine. That's exactly what we want to do. And while we were there, uh, Judy got out her sailwright sewing machine and did some extra stitching on the Genoa. It was so handy having this large space to work in rather than trying to fiddle with the sail in either the cockpit or the main salon. So being able to spread out on the dock, still with power, with a place to sit, work, was it, it worked out very nicely. Now this is the view from the Berkeley Yacht Club. This is the Golden Gate Bridge over here. This is the main part of Chicago, no, San, or Francisco. San Francisco here. And this is the Oakland Bridge going over to Oakland. Uh, this goes up north to uh, the uh, Central Bay or and the uh, North Bay and Susan Bay and up into the um, estuary where the Sacramento and the San Joaquin River uh, merge. While we were there, the Yacht Club had a rendezvous over at a place called Clifford Cove. And so here is Valeda with a lot of other boats from Berkeley Yacht Club uh, having a nice couple of days there in Clifford Cove. Uh, Clipper Cove is just at the base of the open bridge and it was called Clipper Cove because it was the home base for the Pan Am Clipper, the flying boat that they had in the uh, 1920s and 30s. Uh, it has since, of course, uh, no longer there and the area was taken over by the military and it was a military transition center where uh, military members were sent from San Francisco over to the uh, islands on World War I or II, and also for Korea and Vietnam. However, there's no military there now at all. And this was the Oakland Bridge that uh, we were uh, anchored under during the nighttime. It had very beautiful lights on it. And uh, this is that same bridge during the day that I and of course, we had to do some touring around uh, San Francisco and uh, their trolley cars. Uh, quite interesting. They are all open, you know, people hanging on and hopping on and off. 
I don't know what their safety record is like, but uh, I know in certain areas of Canada that, that would not be allowed. So these went up and down the hills of San Francisco. And here we are going down one of the hills. We're looking across the bay now. This is Alcatraz Island over here, and then beyond it is another large island called Angel Island. And we went up to this Angel Island. Uh, this is uh, Fort McDowell, which is no longer a fort. It's an abandoned military site. There is a bit of a state park there, but uh, most of the facilities of the fort have been uh, abandoned for many years. And I, I get a kick out of going through some of these old abandoned uh, buildings. And these were some of the officer quarters. And they're very good houses in good shape, but decaying because of non-use. While we were there, it was Navy week. Even though there is no Navy as such, the uh, military has gone down to San Diego. So there's very little naval presence or military presence in San Francisco at present. And uh, there was a sail pass of this uh, amphibious launching ship and an American uh, destroyer. There were several ships, warships, uh, including HMCS Calgary. It was down there for the uh, Naval Week festivities. <laughs> When the ships were alongside, we were allowed to go on board several of them, but they always had these uh, rib patrol boats armed with machine guns and an uh, armed crew uh, because they wanted to make sure that no other boat would come within a couple of hundred yards of these uh, military ships while they were alongside. Uh, after an incident uh, where an American ship was uh, sabotaged and blown up by a, a suicide boater, they keep people a long distance away from them. So this is one of the uh, amphibious warships. They say it's an amphibious warship because it can launch amphibious uh, vehicles and troops. Uh, it's also a helicopter platform. Uh, it can perform military operations or uh, operations humanitarian relief in uh, areas. So this is the flight deck of that uh, particular ship. It's not an aircraft carrier per se, it, uh, but it does operate several fleets of helicopters, including this. This is the Black Hawk helicopter. If you remember there's a movie made a number of years ago called Black Hawk Down. And these are a very versatile military uh, helicopter uh, with a lot of weaponry available, not only machine guns, but it can also fire missiles and do a variety of other tasks. This is the inside of that ship. Now, this is why it's, it can carry amphibians. What happens is that this area is below the water line, and they will flood this area up to uh, this point. And then they will open the doors, and uh, amphibian, uh, amphibians can come in or go out of that particular entrance to the vessel. And we have, of course, had to go down on board HMCS Calvary. Uh, and this is our aircraft uh, helicopter hangar here. It was only an upper deck uh, tour, so that uh, we were as impressed as we were when we were able to go to the inside of the American boat. But this is the uh, up forward, the forward gun hopeful of the HMCS Calvary. While we're there, the American Blue Angels did their uh, aerobatics. Here they are doing a low flying uh, past with their uh, wheels down. Another interesting ship was this one. It's the uh, SS Jerry O'Brien, which is an original World War II Liberty ship. And these were the ships that were manufactured in bulk during World War II for the Battle of the Atlantic. On board, you can just see the old fine old booms and mangled cranes. Their gun sponsors, sponsors, Swanson, pardon me, were made of concrete, not metal. Then we went up to the northern areas and we went past Tucson Bay. And this particular area is, what's penitentiary? San Quentin. This is a San Quentin uh, penitentiary uh, up north there. And just beyond this row of hills, is another interesting area called Napa Valley. And this is where uh, there is very wide, good wine making area for uh, 
California there. And apple wineries are, are world famous. We went up to the ship graveyard uh, in Kingston Bay. And all of these ships are permanently anchored there. Most of them are going to be awaiting destruction. At one point in time, there used to be hundreds of military ships up in this uh, anchorage area, but uh, they have all been uh, reduced to scrap. The idea being that these ships are never going to be started up in kind of a, in time of war. The particular current theory is that it's a come as you are war, but there will not it will not be long enough to resurrect some of these old ships or to build new ones. And uh, so we had a chance to see these few vessels while we were, uh, they are in their dinghy. It was quite interesting to uh, putter around them. Including these, these are, these are what I call pre-position supply ships. And at one point in time, especially during the Cold War era, they were uh, loaded up with supplies that could support a, uh, a military brigade for up to three months at a time with all the supplies, tanks, ammunition uh, on that. Uh, and they were pre-positioned in different parts of the world so they could be immediately activated uh, in times of conflict. Going up there was a harbor um, channel going right up to Stockton over a hundred miles inland. So here is a, a large ship coming down uh, and this is up in Susan Bay. Up there in the estuary, it was a beautiful uh, reserve area. And so we anchored there for a few days and uh, enjoyed just uh, puttering around the marshes and that. However, right behind this area here is the main channel for ships that would go up as far as stock. I'm not sure if this is a uh, telephone pole someplace, or if it is the, uh, a mass of a ship that's going by. But we enjoyed several days up in this uh, little bit of wilderness, including all these lovely egrets and the water hyacinths. Then we went down to the Southern Bay and uh, there they have a, a couple of areas for floating homes. So these are very expensive floating homes down in the southern bays of San Francisco. And the southern bay, here's the Open Bay Bridge. So this vessel had come through or under the Open Bridge and it's a large container ship. And we had to make sure that we stayed out of its way because we were not sure uh, exactly uh, where it was going. And here's another vessel alongside a container port with all these cranes that are able to haul these uh, containers off and on. So we're now getting ready to leave. So this is the picture taken again, looking at the Golden Gate Bridge from the uh, Berkeley Yacht Club. And then again, another pesky seagull got in the way there. And so we are now on our way down to the Los Angeles area. So that we left San Francisco and we stopped at a couple of spots on here in Santa Cruz and Monterey Bay. And then we went all the way down to Morro Bay. And this was about a, uh, from here to Morro Bay, it was about a 200 mile run. Uh, we spent a few days there. And then from there, we went around Point Conception and we're now going into the Los Angeles area. We were out here in the Channel Islands and then went around the Los Angeles area and down to San Diego you know, from San Diego down into Mexico to Ensenada where we made our entry to Mexico. Morro Bay is noted by this large uh, mountainous rock at the entrance. These buoys are available for use or you can anchor up the bay here. An interesting thing we saw there were these particular boats. They were a, an American uh, experimental boat, two of them, and they have a very low profile and they were uh, very uh, basically secretive. They, they are designed to have minimum radar detection. Stealth. Stealth, yeah. But some of the um, areas were taken over by all of these uh, elephant seals and the sea lion, and they smelled so that, you know, we could if we wanted to brought our boat alongside, but no way well, these guys took control. It wouldn't have been a very good idea. They're bigger than we are. 
I'm not sure they would have agreed that we could go alongside. And while we were there, we went on a uh, boat tour. Whale know, watching trip. It's just like, you know, a, a busman's holiday. When we were there, we go on a, a boat tour. But we saw these, with this one field of dolphins. There were dozens or hundreds of dolphins in this particular uh, activity. And we were there around Halloween. So the local uh, yacht club had uh, these witches paddle down the harbor and they go over to the different boats and get uh, candies or booze uh, as donated by the different boats. So here we are at anchor getting ready to leave from uh, Morro Bay. Now we went down around Conception, we anchored here in the Kojo Anchorage, and then we went out to the Channel Islands. And we didn't spend much time there. We went to one spot, it was too rolly, and we went to another spot and stayed overnight, but it was not very comfortable. So we didn't spend any time on Channel Islands. But we went into Channel Islands Harbor. Yeah, and... I have the feeling that the Channel Islands are a wonderful destination to go to if you're in Los Angeles, not because they're a wonderful destination, just that they're nicer than anything else nearby. I don't know that, that in and of themselves, they're not all that great, but they're the, the closest to wilderness that people can get to. Yeah, this, this is all Los Angeles area right down. So this is very heavily built up. And we stayed here at the Corinthian Yacht Club in Channel Island Harbor. And uh, again, uh, they accepted us and we spent several times alongside. And here their homes were quite uh, wealthy and on the inland uh, canals. canal that they had. We visited a friend, a friend of uh, Aaron's who was down there. Uh, this is in another very, uh, this was a very called Huntington. And uh, we had a chance to visit with him. And this was the inside of his house. It's uh, the beautiful, beautiful statuary in the house. He had a very impressive uh, place. Now, as we're going down the Roth Los Angeles, there are a lot of these oil rigs. And you can see them uh, offshore, but uh, some of them are even closer inshore, such as this one. Now with these rigs, uh, they have several of them that are on shore. This particular location here is an oil rig, but it would look too uh, unsightly for the uh, upscale homes and that. And so they camouflage it uh, to, with a tower uh, hidden in this kind of an arrangement. And we're down now in the central area of Venice Beach and Muscle Beach. Uh, we didn't go ashore there, but uh, we saw some of these people strolling along in roller skates, Muscle Beach down there as well. This shows the fog or the, the smog, smog that is over Los Angeles almost on a permanent basis. And when we were down in where was Long, this? Beach. Long Beach, we had a chance to see the Queen Mary. This is the original Queen Mary built uh, uh, just before World War II, and it served as a troop ship in World War II, and I think it carried something like over 15,000 troops at various times across yeah. the Atlantic. And at the time, I believe, was the largest ship in the world. Yeah, I, I actually remember seeing this ship at sea as a cruise ship when I was in the Navy in the uh, 19, late 1950s. I remember seeing these very red smokestacks uh, that you could see before the ship actually came over the horizon. Right now, it's the museum ship. People can go and tour around it, or it's also a, a hotel ship so that people can uh, stay on board for days at a time. But here it shows you the difference between the original ship, which is one of the largest in the world, and these cruise, the current cruise ships, which are far larger than the uh, Queen Mary. As we left uh, this, we saw this lovely island here. We were wondering if it was a resort, but no, this is a tower for an oil rig. And so this entire island is set up with uh, an oil rig facility. It's actually an artificial island. It's the base for the, for the um, oil well. As we're going down now, we're getting, this is a place called Mission Bay, just north of San Diego. 
uh, a lovely bay. We were able to anchor in here and the area, uh, park area around it was very well groomed. Uh, a lovely Southern California kind of situation. In San Diego, the uh, harbor here, this is the Midway uh, Mar Marine Park. And there's this iconic statue uh, of a picture that was in the Life magazine at the end of World War II with the sailors celebrating uh, the end of World War II. Uh, right now, that apparently is not politically correct. And there have been feminist organizations that campaigned against it. In the background, this is the uh, USS uh, Midway. And you can see the size of this statue in comparison to the other people in the park. Another one that I like, though, was this one called Daddy's Home. And again, it shows the picture of a husband and wife and a child. The husband either about to take off or has maybe just come home uh, from overseas deployment. The Coronado Island is off on the outer side of San Diego, and it is the home for several nuclear aircraft carriers. This is the bridge going across Coronado Island. The smaller warships, the frigates and cruisers and uh, destroyers minesweepers go down and underneath the bridge and are in the far side. San Diego is a real major military base with Marines, uh, air, aircraft carriers, airfields, and uh, army training facilities. So there were three uh, of these large nuclear aircraft carriers in port there while we were there. And we saw this one small minesweeper that was going down to go underneath the uh, Coronado Bridge. And this is the USS Midway. This was the first supercarrier that was finally built and commissioned just at the end of World War II. It's conventionally powered, it's not nuclear powered, but uh, it was the new breed of supercarrier that uh, emerged after World War II. Uh, it was very heavily involved in uh, Korea and Vietnam, uh, at, uh, and then it is now serving as a museum ship. So that uh, I had a chance to go aboard it and uh, Judy stayed home that yeah. day. Somehow after the first eight or nine, uh, yet another aircraft carrier loses its appeal if you're not Navy. Yeah, I, every time we're in a place where there's a, a military ship uh, available for touring, I have to go through. We've been through some battleships and aircraft carriers and submarines and that, but uh, Judy had had enough, so she decided to stay home. And then from there, we went down to Ensenada, and this is our entry into Mexico. And we've been in Mexico uh, and Central America uh, since uh, the late 1960, no, 19, uh, no, 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 2016. Yeah. So this is us. Uh, this is our, our boat. We've, we've got decals of all the countries of the world we've been to. And on this side of the mast, we have uh, the vessels in uh, Canada and Bermuda and Bahamas, and then over here, all the ones that we went to in Europe. On the far side of the mast, we have all the other ones that we beat to in Central America and some of the other Caribbean islands. Uh, so this is in about 2016. This is our, our bimini that we built ourselves. Uh, we have limber holes at the forward part uh, so that we can collect rainwater from the bimini. Uh, we, it's been very helpful for that. And so this is, that was our trip down. It was only, a, it was about 1,500 miles from uh, Vancouver uh, and Port Angeles down to San Diego. And uh, it took us, we were there for, I think it was two and a half months to, to make that particular yeah. trip. Yeah, we were in Ensenada for, uh, U.S. Thanksgiving that year, yeah. just after the election. Yeah, <laughs> incidentally, in Ensenada, going down the Baja Peninsula, that is a high-priced area, and uh, we had a choice of two marinas in Ensenada. Uh, we chose the cheaper of the two, which was only sixty-five dollars a night for our boat. The other marina would have been ninety-five dollars a night, and these are, of course, in U.S. Uh, fees. 
Now, I've been making logs. I've written over 500 logs. And these are the logs that cover the area that we were dealing with today. And if any of you would like to have copies of these logs, they are far more detailed than what we've covered in our presentation today. Send me an email at this email address, svbeledaiv at hotmail.com. Uh, and uh, that would get to me. And let me know if you'd like any particular one of them or the whole group. And I'll be glad to uh, return them to you. So that is our presentation on uh, going down. We uh, enjoyed it. The, the wind was in our favor most of the way. Uh, we had uh, northerlies or northwesterlies uh, most of the way yeah. down. And a south setting current, so which is why we were making good better than our 100 mile a day average. But um, it would, it, we were not looking, the idea of going back north up that coast is not a lot of fun. <laughs> yeah. In fact, if somebody comes through the Panama Canal and wants to go up to Vancouver, they will frequently go from uh, Panama over to Hawaii because they can sail that lake and then from Hawaii up to Vancouver uh, because again, they can sail that lake. So it, uh, they, they do almost twice the distance, but they're at least able to do it. Trying to sail north on the west coast is a real slog. So that's our presentation. Any questions or comments? Yeah, well, that would just, uh, just go over how people could ask questions. Uh, just to keep it orderly on the, uh, uh, this virtual session, we asked you to raise your hands and then we'll recognize people in, on, in order and ask you on mute. All you have to do is look for your uh, Zoom uh, toolbar, click on participants. This will bring something up like that and just click on raise hand and uh, we'll recognize you with your questions. So well, let's go ahead. Are there any questions? Diane, you wanna go ahead? Um, yes, I'd be happy to go ahead. I, I found that absolutely fascinating and I, I am forever in awe of your traveling around the world uh, together the way you do. This particular trip was interesting because I noticed uh, an emphasis on the military that seems to be a focus, especially around the California area. Um, the stealth boats take me back to the stealth police cars they tried to put in place in Toronto, which were quickly, um, I wouldn't say banished, but certainly there was a, a big hoopla about them and why, why do we need stealth police cars in Toronto? And so they were changed. The paint job on the cars was changed. But um, thank you for that. Uh, as always, thorough, interesting, wonderful spots you visited. And uh, kind of a courageous thing to go down the coast of the West, the West Coast of the United States because there are so few places where you could stop in in an emergency. You know, you would be, you'd have to put out a mayday rather than find a place to, to stop in. Yeah, that's, that's correct because there are not that many anchorages on the West Coast. And uh, so, you know, we had several parts where we had to travel over 200 nautical miles in order to get to the, the next mm. location that we could uh, anchor. That's why we bypassed the state of Washington. The only place that we could have gone in there would have been at the Columbia River, and we just didn't want to negotiate that bar. So we totally bypassed Washington. Well, yeah, there, there, and actually, there were a few small places we could have gone in if the weather were absolutely perfect. But the reason you want to go in is because the weather isn't perfect. So, um, yeah, right, exactly. I was interested to see where the Washington River was. Um, I watched a documentary recently about. Uh, protecting the orca whales along the northwest coast mm -hmm. of the United States. And indeed, on the Washington River, they have removed some dams in order to allow the salmon to run up the river again so that the orcas will be able to have their salmon because mm -hmm. they were literally starving, which is yeah. why the pod only has 74 orcas in it right now. Yeah, so, we saw quite a few whales and dolphins on the way down. In fact, a couple of times we were frightened by them because they came within 100 feet of the boat. Yeah. At one point in time, I had to actually 
maneuver to make sure that I wasn't going to cross the, the path of a, a couple of whales that were surfacing uh, forward of our boat. And another oh. time, one splashed within 20 feet of us, and you know, it was quite frightening to see a, a whale uh, breaching, uh, who was probably bigger than the boat, <laughs> only 20 feet away. Frightening and exhilarating, I can imagine. Yes, yeah. But it's, it's one thing for the rules to say that you must stay you know, X meters from, from the whales. The whales don't read the rules. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know there were such rules. I mean, it makes a lot of sense from uh, both from the perspective of the whale and the perspective of your boat. But yeah, um, yeah, yeah there are a lot imagine. of whale watching boats that uh, tend to frighten a whale because they, they know where the whales are and they come too close and uh, so there are the regulations that boats are not supposed to be within 100 or 200 feet of, of whales. That's okay. excellent. Uh, go, uh, Liz, go ahead with your question. Yes, I'm, I'm interested in if you had to provision your boat for the whole trip or where you, were you able to stop in and get supplies? Well, I, I, we had basic staples that could have done us the whole way. I, I tend to overshop. But um, then, then you're into dried and canned things. We were we were stopping to get fresh food along the way. Yeah, we we caught a couple of fish. Uh, in fact, one of the places that we were at, they were selling tuna, and we went oh. over to the fishermen and said, "Oh, can we buy some?" And they said, "Well, no, we can we can only sell you the whole fish." <laughs> so we had to look at you know what are we going to do with 25 pounds of tuna on our boat? So, <laughs> Wouldn't 25 pounds be a small tuna? <laughs> yes. That would be a small tuna. No, I, I, that, yeah. That was the thing. They were able, they said, well, we're really only supposed to sell the whole thing, but we've got we've got we've got this this one that was, you know, we've got some scraps, but we can only sell you the whole lot. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, anybody else have any questions? Please virtually raise your Zoom hand. Okay. Well, again, thank you, Aubrey and Judith. Um, we so much appreciate traveling with you vicariously. And I understand you're going to be back in the new year and give us one more vicarious trip. And we look yes, forward to that. That's right. We, uh, we're going to be making a presentation in January. Uh, and this one's going to be on our return trip, our go home trip from El Salvador up to Mexico when we were trying to bring the boat back to Canada. And uh, Aaron Fenton was also uh, helping me on that. And uh, that's what we're going to be talking about uh, in January. Oh, yes, Aaron will join you. That's excellent. That's excellent. So let's give our guest speakers here a nice warm round of applause. We can, you can look at it. We can't. You can't hear it, but yeah. thank you. And I will be sending out some pins to you in the mail. I'm not sure if I have your address. If I haven't, I'll email you and well, make sure. Diane, we much as we appreciate the pins, we actually have several. So <laughs> the club might perhaps just we, we will accept the thought of the pins and not worry about the physical pins at this point. Thank you so much. We appreciate that. <laughs> we can give you another round of applause for that. Thank you. Um, and so we have a look at next week. Judith is going to be talking to us about seafarers and COVID-19. And um, I'm really looking forward to that. You know, we take for granted all those groceries on the shelves and we have noticed differences on the shelves during COVID. Um, those seafarers go through things that we may not have even thought about, um, but if you put your mind to it, you can think about how far they are from home and yeah. how challenging it might be to get uh, even communication with family. So we'll look forward to that next week, Judith. And then coming up in January, Ron is going to return, as he promised, to talk about the eastern end of Toronto Harbor and the development plans there. So with that, we'll have pipes out. But remember, we have some uh, breakout rooms afterwards if you wish to join.
Pipes out. Okay. I'll put us back on for a moment.